welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. This is Sudisha, Junior Research Scholar at the Takshashila Institution. Today I have with me another alumnus from Takshashila's PGP course who completed a capstone project on creating a policy framework on building four new 2 million plus population cities in, in Karnataka. And today we are going to talk about everything related to building new cities for economic growth and job creation in India. Sudeep is an independent consultant. He has close to 14 years of experience building state capacity across urban and rural local governments. He's currently involved in designing a climate change mitigation program and designing technology interventions with local governments for better civic engagement. Sudeep, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Sudisha. My pleasure. So let's start with the first question. In our project, we keep talking about how new cities can help create more jobs. Gurugram, for example, has around 200,000 migrant workers, and it's a relatively recent city. So can you explain why new cities have not been created despite their obvious potential? Oh, yes. So I think there are multiple reasons why we've not been able to create you know, great cities in India. Of course, we do have great cities, not that they've been created you know, of late. We've not seen cities with a vision in mind. So that is in turn kind of uh, translated into haphazard growth of cities and, you know, cities growing without a particular intent or a vision in mind, right? So what has happened is without a vision, you can't actually kind of build a city that actually helps you either, you know, get a great living standard or you have a lot of jobs created. These cities have grown without particular plan in mind. So what has happened is because we don't have a vision, we've not invested enough in these cities. And as a result, obviously, when you don't invest, you don't expect returns. So that's not happened. And most importantly, the investment that I'm speaking of is two prong, right? One is the infrastructure investment that goes into a city and the softer or the governance infrastructure that goes into maintaining and running a city. Both of these, I think, have been heavily underinvested in across the country. So we've either seen cities that have grown haphazardly and have not really kind of worked either for the people or for the government. It's it's just there. It's, It's working for a small set of population for us, right? So yeah, so that's that explains why we've not really kind of invested in the cities. So when we don't invest, we we kind of don't end up nurturing older cities also, far less you know building new ones. Thanks for that explanation. So now a bigger question. How do you finance new cities? We know that it can be a massive challenge, but how massive are we talking exactly? And if you can answer, how do you ensure that the money invested in creating new cities results in job creation also? So um, before we get into how to finance, right, Sudesha, I think we should ask what is the size of finance that we are looking for our cities? You know, how much, And out of that, how much have we been attending to? To get a sense, let's look at the data, right? So total capital expenditure in urban infrastructure has been averaging around 0.6% roughly between 2011 and 2018 or it's, it's around 26 US dollars in per capita terms, right? And current levels of spending also appear to be below international benchmarks. Like, you know, China's investment in um, urban infrastructure has been averaging around 2.8% of their GDP between 2000 and 2014. And uh, this is 2010 figures, right? This is from the McKinsey report. So going by that, when we see what is the quantum of uh, investment that we need, The latest World Bank report that was released in November 2022, it talks about financing India's urban infrastructure needs. It estimates around $850 million that will be needed to invest between 2020 and 2036. And that's around double the investment that we're looking at. So 1.18% of the estimated uh, GDP over this particular period. right? And, And we are talking only of CapEx on urban infrastructure and municipal services, right? 
So what this includes is urban transport, primarily mass and metro rail, basic municipal services, water supply, sewage, solid waste management, stormwater drainage, urban roads, street lighting, and social and community infrastructure. And most importantly, this excludes housing and slum upgradation, which will still call for additional resource to be pumped in. So out of this $850 million that we've been uh, you know, uh, talking about, so we are looking at $300 billion only for mass transit and the remaining for basic municipal services, right? So the kind of investment that will go into these cities is by any measure compared to what we are investing now, it's at least, you know, double the what we are investing and what we have been investing for the last 10 years or so. And when you look at it, when you break it down for individual urban local bodies, there's at least for at least tier one, these non-metro, non-1 million cities, when we look at that, at least a 6x or 4x hike in their budgets. So we're talking of a large sum of money here, right? And uh, without harnessing the private sector investment, without municipal bonds, without commercial debt financing, this is not going to be an easy task for any of our states or cities for that matter, right? So, yeah, so that's the kind of investment that we're looking at. And uh, also in terms of the capacity to, you know, finance these investments, capacity to harness these investments, we're still not there yet in terms of the institutional framework of the ULPs. We've not invested enough on building their capacity to handle such big investments either, right? So whatever money they've received, it's if you look at any of these cities, the grants from state and union governments constitute a big chunk of their funds. Apart from, the, I think that ranks first, the grants. The second is perhaps urban property tax, which remains the largest own source of revenue, is only 5% of GDP in aggregate nationwide in India, right? If you do a comparison of similar middle income countries, you see it ranges somewhere between 03 to 0.6%. So there itself, I think we are you know, lagging behind. So unless you have that institutional and fiscal capacity to raise those basic minimum resources, you're not going to be able to tap into the resources the private sector can offer. Any investor would kind of hesitate to say, you know, I'll, I'll put my money here and probably get back X percent after X, Y years. So I, I don't think that's going to happen unless we look at the own source revenue being much better than what it is right now. And also, if you look at the service charges, we are, I mean, very few urban local bodies, ULBs or parastatals are in a position to recover the basic service costs, right? I mean, these are these are supposed to be almost at market and agencies that recover costs if not kind of make a small degree of profit over it. But we've not been doing that either. So given this state, I think there's a lot of shifts that we should work on in terms of institutional and fiscal capacities of these ULBs or agencies working in cities before we kind of say, uh, you know, we're going to tap into the commercial market, private debt financing and all that stuff, right? So that's about the quantum of funds we need and what is that money that we should be able to leverage from the market. So, But the good part is, I think the Amrut scheme that was actually run by the government, I think before the Smart Cities mission or parallelly, I'm not so sure of its uh, chronology. In fact, that Amrut scheme actually kind of had incentives for cities to, you know, they had relaxed, if I'm not wrong, to relax the norms to raise debt from the market and you know, float bonds and all that. But none of the cities have actually leveraged the scheme, right? And and also that partly that stems from the capacities and also the intention of these cities, right? So we don't have an independent leadership in these ULBs to kind of steer these organizations. Most of the ULBs in India, at least from what I can um, kind of readily recollect, at least in Karnataka's case, the ULBs, this is a CAG report that performance audit that talks about ULBs. It says only around 5 or 10% of the functions in the 12th schedule are independently, completely handled by the ULBs. The remaining, I think, 8 or 10 are all either they have a very supplementary role to play or they have a, you know, kind of a supporting role to play to the state government or parastatals or any other agencies like, you know, BMRCL in Bangalore's case, uh, they actually kind of do a very supporting role there. So unless we 
have an integrated organization that looks at the city as a whole, has a vision, has an action plan. It's it's only then that they will feel the pressure to raise resources, get their act together, and you know go ahead and access different kinds of funds. Yeah. So on that note, you covered the finance part, but what else is required apart from finances to build a new city? Building a new city, is it? Yeah. Not even just building new cities. Let's say we are improving pre-existing town and converting it into a city. So what apart from finances is required? Like I said earlier, the capacity of these agencies that run or uh, manage these urban areas or towns or cities or you know, municipal corporations, municipalities, town municipal councils, whatever you want to call it, right? So that is, I don't know how much to stress on that because I think that's where we are severely lacking. It's, it's a kind of a chicken and egg type of a problem, if I can say that. You know, the state governments have been generally unwilling to devolve more powers to the ULBs. And at the same time, uh, ULBs have not built their own capacities. Again, the personnel aspect of it is to a large extent, the leadership in most of these urban local bodies across the country is again kind of managed by the state governments. In very few places do you find ULBs actually independently appointing commissioners or, you know, town planners or urban planners on their own, you know, in their own wisdom, right? So you don't find that. It's it's extremely, extremely rare. So unless we build on that capacities, we are going to have a haphazard growth in cities, even, you know, mega cities like, let's say, Delhi or Bangalore or Mumbai, if we had the right institutional mechanisms in place in terms of a metropolitan planning committee or uh, you know an adjoining district planning committees and things like that, we would have definitely organized better, assuring that you know, people get a decent quality of living and hence kind of providing them a ladder to wealth and prosperity. Right. Okay, let's take a short break and we will come back in a few minutes. Okay, we're back. So, Sudeep, let's come to the next question. I read your project in which you mentioned that tier two cities generally have a better growth rate. So on that note, what's the ideal size of a city in India? And another question on that, is it better to set up new cities or improve existing small towns into cities? So this is, let's take the first one, right? the second one first, right? So in terms of do you want to develop uh, new cities or, you know, do you want to build on the existing cities purely in terms of there, there are points for and against both of these right so purely in terms of cost definitely building on what we already have is going to be much much more cheaper again uh, referring back to this McKinsey report that was released quite a while back somewhere in around 2010 or 2011 that report predicts that you know building a new city is one and a half times costlier than building on something that is already there so purely in terms of cost i think it's better to build on you know an existing city right so also this is you know sorry to keep harping back on the capacities right so given the capacities that we have and um, given the institutional lack of institutional arrangements building new cities is going to kind of create you know create i think it's 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 again going to create an urban haphazard urban urbanization rather than probably say invest on say four or five cities in a state and say you know we'll set the institutional matrix here right first and let's kind of build on that so in in terms of financial land as well as institutional capacity i would say my preference would be to kind of build on what we already have in terms of cities right the ideal size as cities grow, they kind of generate these agglomeration economies, what we've been very familiar with, right? So, but there are also externalities that kind of go along with greater population densities. Uh, so, a policy towards medium and large cities, it also needs to not only recognize the effect of these externalities, but also understand how these effects differ by city size. You know, just because agglomeration economies exist uh, does not imply that we kind of favor mega cities or big cities. I mean, from whatever I know, it's difficult to pinpoint an ideal size, especially in India. Given that, given the political system size and population that we are, 
we don't have benchmarks that come close to a country like ours, right? So for instance, China, it has two mega cities. It's not a comparison between China and India, but yeah, in, in terms of population, they have two mega cities by Chinese standards. Shanghai and Beijing, which are almost three crore and two crore population, respectively. And they have around 17 cities that are above four million. And out of these 17, there are around six cities that match up to the population of Bangalore, around 1 to 1.2 crore or 12 million, so to say. Right. So given our capacity, institutional and given the population, I'd say it's it's good to target cities that are over 1 million and maybe, you know, reach the 2 million mark. But we should be prepared to handle mega cities, right? It's not a either or option that we have here. Mega cities have their own edge. You know, how much ever we invest in in, in the report that uh, I have written uh, that you referred to earlier, how much ever we kind of invest and build in tier two cities, you don't want to take that edge of Bangalore at all. I mean, this is one of those fastest cities, fast growing cities on earth. So you you don't want to kind of take the edge of Bangalore and it's very difficult to take the edge of Bangalore as well, how much ever you invest elsewhere. So it's not like we are disfavoring mega cities, but I think given the size of our population, given our economic aspirations of being a global big economy, we need to invest in cities and we need to kind of, like I said, target somewhere between 1 million plus and 2 million population in each of these cities so before we go to that right so if we look at the growth of urban areas so census towns have grown at 185 percent between 2001 and 2011 class 5 cities have grown 110 percent and million plus cities have grown 51 percent this was in 2011 right so i think over the last 10 12 years these rates either would have kind of maintained themselves definitely in terms of census towns i would say and million plus cities, I'm not sure. I mean, this is just, you know, throwing stones into the dark, right? So so looking at these figures, what we kind of can easily gather is there is a lot of scope to bring people, incentivize people to move away from rural areas to, say, a class one town that is just below a million population rather than kind of, this is, we don't have a design right now to bring people from, rural areas to say a class one town the incentives that we need to provide are better infrastructure better education better health care and looking at the clustering around class five and census towns i'm pretty sure if you provide similar kind of infrastructure not when i say similar not census town similar better infrastructure in terms of health health care education infrastructure and housing i'm pretty sure people will be motivated to move to bigger cities one more thing I wanted to kind of bring to, you know, this is like a large, taking a look at the larger picture, right? Almost all in terms of the classification of towns that we have, right? If you look at that, the overall urban population is between 47 and 50 percent of, uh, you know, India. Like basically, India is 47 to 50 percent urban. But if we leave out, you know, the non-urban classified areas, according to the government definition, we fall to around um, 31 to 37 percent, if I'm not wrong, right? So that is the larger picture. So we are moving from a rural to a largely urban society, but I think our systems, our governance systems, have not really kind of managed to harness that to the extent that's possible. In any other country, uh, if you look at the definitions, I think we are easily 50 percent urban. So, uh, Sudeep, I just want to ask you another question, which is how do you attract people from rural areas to shift to urban centers and what incentivizes them to stay there and, let's say, engage in economic activities? Okay. So, we should talk about you know, generally building cities, right? One is to incentivize people to move from rural to urban areas. The other is generally to build that competitive edge of city where you actually attract a lot more skilled workers and, you know, with high-end skills to come and work in this city, right? So in terms of attracting rural population, we should look at providing them with decent healthcare, education, basic amenities, and, you know, for them to easily travel and find work here in cities. So it's important that we build cities that are inclusive and not kind of, you know, gentrified, so to say that people are actually pushed out to the boundaries and with very little or 
limited access to work and you know they don't generally appear in anyone's radar more so in a, in a policies radar so building cities that are actually inclusive that are more welcoming to every section of the population not I mean, see this is also part of that design that we spoke of right we've not uh, specifically designed cities to work for everybody it works for a very narrow set of population but in terms of anybody coming in a fresh from a rural area getting to trying to get out of poverty i don't think we have the best setups in terms of cities for such population right that is one and then and the other part is you know how what policies should we look at in terms of attracting uh, skilled workers i think one again it goes back to the same you know safe streets good schools faster commutes these are valued by everyone it doesn't matter when you whether you're working as a an investment banker somewhere or a carpenter i think these are some things that are common to all of us right so that doesn't kind of vary between income levels of a person and also there's this famous us uh, i think governor or senator who said uh, the best way to build an urban area is to build a university and wait for 200 years so he says educational institutions are they like you know the bedrock of uh, all urban development and when you get you know i mean of course uh, in india i think we are at least kind of in the slightly higher hdi uh, ranking states each district or at least the district headquarters has a decent educational higher educational system so i think these institutions you know supplemented with a nice you know uh, socio cultural ecosystem in terms of the freedom to you know go out stay with late nights all those things are very auxiliary i mean very extreme you know fringe cases but i think they are still attract the right kind of you know skilled workers to such areas yeah that's a good point and i just want to just circle back to the us senator thing that you said so in the past I, i've seen that cities in india generally have been set up around river banks for example because they are close to a water body sometimes cities get organically built around universities but in the current economic landscape can you make a guess or an assumption about what could be the focal point of those cities could unemployment be one what other things do you think can help build cities organically so whether we like it or not uh, sudisha we are urbanizing right i mean the figures that i gave you earlier the increase in census towns and class 5 towns and class 1 towns i mean i don't think there's any other country that's urbanizing in such large numbers right we don't even need a reason we are urbanizing i mean this is there's no denying that we are urbanizing just that i think you're right earlier we go through history we see sometimes the quality of soil was the one that actually determined whether the city was built there or somewhere else right so right now it's not a determinant at all i mean uh, going by the way the, the nature of work is changing i don't think actually soil is a big determinant at all right as as long as we are able to procure food and grains from somewhere else but i see your point for me from a from a policy perspective i think it makes a sense for government to invest in good you know in enhancing the livability of cities and providing an environment where you know there's rule based businesses to be conducted without fear or favor right so i think these are two critical aspects to help a city grow right so i mean yes the other aspects in terms of good law and order decent education good you know civic infrastructure in terms of transport sewage water supply electricity all these are like i am treating them as a given i know there's there's certain bias in it but yes these are treating it as given but yeah i mean if you provide a decent standard of living and if, if you provide a kind of a fear free environment for businesses to conduct themselves i think it's it's a recipe enough for cities to discover their own you know mojo so to say in terms of they will figure out what is good for them they will figure out their competitive edges they will figure out they where the market is and along with that if we have the necessary what is the ideal size of a city right if you have a city that is 1 million plus or close to 2 million i think that itself is a market enough for the city to kind of start standing on its own and figuring out where it has to go 
what is the interest that they have in you know conducting business and you know what is the competitive edge and all that stuff so i don't think there is a single determinant and also uh, right so such cities where which are not built on one particular so to say sector or uh, you know one particular natural resource right so something like i don't know which uh, which example to take so something like say in closer home uh, something like a badravati in shimoga district which was built around factories right there was a sugar factory there was an iron and steel factory there was a paper factory i think those kind of cities lack that economic resilience once you shut down or once the market conditions are so bad that you have to shut down the iron and steel factory and the paper factory you're done i mean the, all the investments that go into that making of city is just you know it's almost like a marketplace so you you've lost your competitive edge and somebody else has taken it over so instead of, i mean whether we like it or not and it's easy also to say the government shouldn't pick winners it should provide a you know level playing field so whichever way the government takes a policy decision it's going to favor one or the other private player so keeping that aside i think the basic things that the government could do is provide a decent quality of living and provide a fear free environment to conduct businesses people will figure out what is good for them what is good for the market what is good for the city and i think that's the kind of recipe that we've not tried so far it's always been kind of government driven and and whenever government directly intervenes in such driven products we can expect that you know what we spoke earlier in terms of picking winners in terms of making choices that are a less than optimal vis-a-vis a market situation these are some things that kind of creep in when you let uh, the government play a big big role in you know kind of fixing or making cities rather than fixing cities right so it's the government's duty to kind of provide whatever it's supposed to provide so yeah yeah i, I actually really like that answer and that brings me to my last question based on what you said about making cities more livable so i live in gurugram for example it's extremely cold right now right and within 2 3 months i know there's a heat wave coming yeah. so you know it's, it's for a daily wage labor for example you know when i go to my office i see that there is a market for these laborers and they stand in the morning in this extreme foggy cold right to get some work and they will do the same when there's a heat wave so i just can't see how this city will be livable enough for most people in a few years when you know climate change impacts us even more so i think my last question to you is how do we make our cities greener right we know that we require economic growth right now but we also need to make our cities sustainable and if we do that do you think it can positively impact job creation so i mean j- just a short <laughs> answer on that gurgaon thing right i mean gurgaon is a th- that city was built on lazefar right i mean there was nothing and there was everything and then the regulation and the whole institutional structure that we keep speaking of are just trying to catch up with what was already happening so i mean i'm not stayed in gurgaon for long enough to be commenting on it but i think this is that's one of the examples of what we should not be doing in building a city if we are to build more inclusive cities right so we don't want to build cities only for you know a certain set of people certain set of incomes a certain set of uh, schools or so i mean this juncture where we are talking about inclusive societies and all that stuff gurgaon is a clear aberration of course in terms of growth i think gurgaon is one of those districts that has had the highest per capita income of around 7.41 lakhs it be- beats bangalore uh, i'm not sure if it beats any of delhi's districts but yeah so the answer yeah. so the question on sustainable cities yes i think in terms of you know mitigation adaptation and resilience we definitely have a lot of scope uh, to include such policies in the actions of uh, cities governments as well as uh, people I, th- i think we've seen great traction in terms of adoption of evs and setting up of infrastructure but i think this is just a small drop in the larger you know sustainability battle that we have kind of begin to understand and comprehend and work on but yeah definitely i think when when the nature of you know business changes there are going to be large scale shifts and um, i'm pretty sure jobs will be taken away jobs will be created like has happened with every major uh, change that we've seen so far 
So to kind of, I mean, that's a difficult answer. I don't have any data specifically to look at it. But yeah, I mean, like I said, new jobs will be created. Some jobs will be lost. But to put a hand on an answer and say, yes, we'll have a definite increase. No, we'll have a definite decrease. I'm not in a position to say that because I've not seen enough data to kind of comment on that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That brings us to the end of this podcast. Thank you so much, Sudeep, for joining me and Thank you, giving new Thank insights. You. Thank you. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.